This episode brought to you by DoorDash, the app that brings you food you're craving right now, right to your door. Also brought to you by Movement, one of the fastest growing watch brands shipping to over 160 countries across the globe. Don't forget to check us out this weekend at Too Many Games in Philadelphia, October 8th to the 10th. Hope to see you there. <laughs> trick or treat, trick or treat, trick or treat, no star to weed. When pumpkins fly and hold your knife, I'm a cameo. Your little home turns green, your little face turns green. This is bull- This little fence not green. And boom, every show, every clock has something to know. And all it takes is one itty bitty mistake. Look out. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember, so you don't have to. And welcome back to Nostalgia Week. We've talked about Nightmare Before Christmas a few times on this show, but never done a full review. Since over the years I've discovered this new thing called liking stuff, I decide this Nostalgia Ween is the perfect time to do it. a modest success when it came out in 1993, The Nightmare Before Christmas has exploded into one of the most popular icons associated with Halloween, and yes, even Christmas. Merchandise sells like mad, people love to dress up as the characters, even the Haunted Mansion is given a makeover in fall and winter to reflect the characters and story. It also started one of my favorite fads of stop motion kids movies that are wonderfully more dark and twisted than most kids movies are. And they're given a free pass by parents because, well, they remember it being fun when The Nightmare Before Christmas did it. Based on Tim Burton's short story of the same name, it takes, honestly, a very complicated and abstract idea and makes it surprisingly simple to follow and enjoy. So what is it about this holiday film that becomes more and more popular where other holiday films seem to fade into the crowd? Well, we're finally gonna watch it from beginning to end to find out. This is Halloween, or is it Christmas? It's clearly Halloween. This is Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. First off, let's address the biggest misconception, this is not a Tim Burton-directed movie. Henry Selick, who would direct another stop-motion masterpiece with Coraline, is the man who called the shots, but the studio insisted Tim Burton's name had more of a draw, and seeing how his spiraled fingerprints are all over it, I think that's fair. It should also be pointed out that the opening narration is by Santa, played by Edward Ivory, but in the soundtrack, it's Patrick Stewart. "'Twas a long time ago, longer now than it seems." "'Twas a long time ago." Longer now than it seems. I like Stewart's fine, but it does go on a little too long, including a closing narration about Jack and Sally having skeleton babies. With four or five skeleton children at hand playing strange little tunes in their xylophone band. I don't know, the idea of them literally boning it is just not something I want to think of. We open in the land of Halloween Town with, I think we can all agree, the most memorable song in the movie. This is Halloween, this is Halloween, 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 Halloween. Though I always saw it as a warped version of the Home Alone theme. This is Halloween, this is Halloween. There's no denying, both this song and intro are amazing. When I saw this on the big screen, it blew my mind. The visuals were so creative and matched the music perfectly. There's so many things to admire, the creative camera angles, which were rarely seen in stop motion then, the fact that they didn't cut out the strings for the bats, which makes it feel more authentic. And I especially love how one of the random characters is just the devil. He's not the ruler, he's not even a major character, he's just one of the residents. This place is hardcore when the fucking devil is just a dude walking around town. <laughs> We're introduced to the Pumpkin King, Jack Skellington, played by Chris Elfman, we'll get to that in a bit, who just finished up scaring the real world for Halloween, but a rag doll named Sally, played by Catherine O'Hara, is being called back by her inventor, Dr. Finkelstein, played by William Hickey. Come back here, you fool! Oh! Oh! I didn't make you to beat my head, I made you to- wait. Jack can't help but feel tired doing the same thing every year, and sings about his frustration. 
Oh, there's an empty place in my bones. So Jack's singing voice is composer and songwriter Danny Elfman, but his speaking voice is Chris Sarandon. And surprisingly, there's several conflicting reasons as to why. Elfman was always going to be the singing voice as he did demos for all the songs and everyone agreed he just sounded great as Jack. Some reports say Elfman didn't want to act as he was too busy with everything else. In fact, he wrote so many songs, writers kept adding characters and plot threads to work them in. Some even saying the film really should have been called Danny Elfman's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Other reports say his singing was love, but his acting not as much. So they passed on him as an actor, possibly resulting in a split Burton and Elfman had for a short period of time. Both reasons are odd, as Elfman does act as other characters in the movie. Whatever the reason, both do a great job. Matching each other's energy and passion perfectly. Christmas time is buzzing in my skull. Call a town meeting and I'll tell everyone all about it. After he sings his woes, Sally finds she'd give her right arm to get her right arm. I made you with my own hands. You can make other creations. Something a lot of people pick up is that the dialogue in this film is not quite like other Disney movies. Keep in mind, this is just around the time Aladdin came out. And animation in general was trying to hit both adults and children. This dialogue is not really trying to do that. It's trying to be simple in the hopes of being more timeless like the Rankin Bass specials. And it works, but it does throw a lot of people off. There's no pop cultural references, in jokes, or hidden adult humor. It's a very basic what you hear is what you get. Which sometimes results in lines that don't always sound the most natural. Curiosity killed the cat, you know. I know. That was a normal thing we just said. But that's also part of the charm. For such a strange idea with strange looking characters, it's easily digestible. Like this concept of trees holding different holidays sounds feasible after watching this, but imagine explaining it in a way that both adults and kids could follow easily. It's probably trickier than you think. Some of these concepts and ideas are so imaginative, a simpler way of telling them makes the most sense. Speaking of which, Jack is sucked into Christmas Town and is blown away by what he sees. What's this? In here, they've got a little tree. How queer! Well, we found the line every kid's gonna snicker at whenever they sing it. A little cozy thing secure inside their dreamland. And we found the out of context picture that'll get me snickering whenever I see it. Ho, 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 ho. After seeing the creepiest Santa shadow, Sally poisons her inventor again by sneaking Harry Potter classes into his soup. Frog's breath will overpower any odor. Worms wart. Mm. After she tricks him into drinking it and giving up just assuming a popular gif, if not get on that internet. Jack returns home and calls a town meeting to explain the strange land he discovered. Even death is invited. Between him and the devil, Christ, I expect to see Christ in the background next. This is a thing called a present. The whole thing starts with a box. No, that gift is from 2006. It's a dick in a box joke. What a splendid idea. This Christmas sounds fun. Though they all seem excited, they don't seem to get what makes Christmas so special. And neither does Jack for that matter, who obsesses over what it's all about. There's got to be a logical way to explain this Christmas thing. Doesn't he know if you turn on even one Netflix Christmas rom-com, you'll be even more confused? Interesting reaction. But what does it mean? What does any of this have to do with Jesus? Sally goes to visit Jack, but first has to figure out how to get down from her tower. I give five more years until people call that problematic. She sends Jack a gift basket, of sorts, and has a vision that Christmas is going to be a disaster. Yeah, she's psychic now. On the one hand, I like that she isn't just a sourpuss, like something has to convince her that Christmas is gonna go wrong, but it comes right out of nowhere! It's vague exactly what it is, whether it's the universe giving her a sign or if she always had the power to predict the future, as it never happened before and doesn't happen later. I always thought it'd be cool if they gave a hint this was a thing, like maybe she used the ability to find the deadly nightshade, or later she looks at the flower and a heart appears, foreshadowing that Jack was about to approach her. But nope, this is it. She's just Walt from Lost, psychic when you need it because you need it. Of course, I've been too close to see. The answer's right in front of me. Jack finally figures Christmas out, sorta, when he discovers he can bring his own unique spin to it. Albert, I could approve it too, and that's exactly what 
Charles do? I'll start it in November. No, October. Hell, September's not doing anything, the lazy ass! Actually, with combining holidays, this film really was ahead of its time. Hmm, what could I do for this week's sponsorship? I think I've literally done every idea there is. Except that one. No way I did that. I mean, I just want to tell people about DoorDash. I mean, let's face it, you've got back-to-back -back meetings, errands to run, and chores to take care of. What's the secret to clearing your to-do list? A little help from DoorDash. You can get dinner, household essentials, and everything on your grocery list delivered. Maybe I can do that thing where I'm trying to think up the idea and that's the idea. No, that's stupid. You know, it's not stupid. DoorDash. You can get what you want to eat right now, right to your door with DoorDash. Along with the restaurants you love, you can now get groceries and other essential items delivered with DoorDash. Get drinks, snacks, and other household items in under an hour. Maybe a dolphin can say this next part, because I don't know. Dolphins. Craving late night ice cream? Forget that one key ingredient for dinner? Or maybe you just need to stock up for a week. With DoorDash, get everything in one app. With over 300,000 partners, you can support your neighborhood go-tos or choose from your favorite national restaurants like Popeyes, Chipotle, and Cheesecake Factory. No. That's stupid. Actually, it's growing on me. Ordering is easy, and your items will be left safely outside your door when you choose contactless delivery drop-off. Maybe he's a flying dolphin. For a limited time. Maybe he flies for a longer time. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code Nostalgia2021. That's 25% off up to a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code Nostalgia2021. Don't forget that's code Nostalgia2021 for 25% off your first order with DoorDash, subject to change, terms supply. Then he'd explode, because death is funny. Speaking of which, how soon will my DoorDash be here? Oh yeah, I forgot. I can look at my new movement watch. I should do that thing where I say I'm gonna tie it into the sponsorship and then say nah, but I do it anyway. Nah. But this watch really is cool. In a tiny apartment in Southern California, two college dropouts teamed up to create a watch company that broke all the rules. With fair prices, unexpected colors, and clean original designs, Movement grew into one of the fastest growing watch brands shipping to over 160 countries across the globe. Maybe the watch should talk, and with a voice that's completely different as mine. Hello, I'm the watch. Yeah, that's perfect. Now movement has expanded into blue light glasses that protect your eyes from your screens. Minimalist jewelry and more style essentials that don't break the bank. All designed out of their California headquarters. Good job, watch. I'm so particularly fond of you. How sleek you are, how cool you look, and how comfortable you feel on my wrist. You're the best classic monochrome link. I'm not even that big a watch guy, but you know what? I'm gonna wear you often. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome, Movement Watch. You have the look of a $400 to $500 watch you're paying for at a department store, but cost a fraction of the price because you were built online and they own the process from start to finish. Think about that, people listening to my thoughts. You get a beautiful watch shipped right to your door for free. And if you don't love it, you can ship it right back for free. And the glasses. Boy, howdy hoody the glasses. I've got to spend all day in front of my computer, and my ever scroll blue light filter and glasses are a game changer. It really helps with eye strain and poor sleeping patterns, and I love the modern style of the frames. Oh, by the way, these sunglasses, they're from Movement too. I tricked you kinda. Why don't you tell them about the deal, Douglas? I will, Movement Watch. If you want to elevate your look with style that doesn't break the bank, then join the Movement and get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns by going to mvmt.com slash nostalgia. Again, that's mvmt.com slash nostalgia for 15% off with free shipping and free returns. Oh well, I gotta think how to end the sponsorship. Maybe if I just stop. Jack requests everybody to chip in to bring his version of Christmas to the people. He calls on Lock, Shock, and Barrel, played by Paul Rubens, Catherine O'Hara, and Danny Elfman, who are given the assignment to kidnap Santa Claus. And I know I'm gonna sound like a dumbass, but I never put together that the mask to hide their faces look exactly like their faces. You ever notice Elfman's favorite lyric is La? By the way, I'm totally convinced this movie's PG rating is based entirely on this look. That's a look that did something dirty and is gonna do it again. I love a kid's film where the feel-good song is the various ways to dispose of a body. I don't want to know how he gets his kicks after Santa's been chopped up, but I'll assume he gives this look. Sally tries to warn Jack what should have been warned to Kirk Cameron. His vision of Christmas is going to be a disaster. 
It was about your Christmas. There was smoke and fire. That's not my Christmas. Mine's more plaguey. He doesn't listen to her and everybody sings about how amazing their Christmas is going to be. These warped gifts still crack me up. I especially love how I think one of them is the Max Shrek logo from Batman Returns. Yeah, did this Burton property sell enough toys for you? Won't they be impressed? I am a genius. That's literally how Great Proops talks before every taping of Who's Line. Just as Jack gets Christmas ready, Santa is abducted and brought to him. After he's taken away, Sally sees the scientist has literally made a new lady friend for himself. We'll have conversations worth having. Yeah, that part of my brain stopped me from peeing. And caring! The kids give Santa to Oogie Boogie, played by Ken Page, who, fun fact, is the big-lipped alligator from All Dogs Go to Heaven. How does this guy get typecast as musical green monsters who sing before they eat people? Because I'm a gambling boogeyman, although I don't play fair. The boogie song is a good change of pace, as most of the color in the movie is in Christmas Town. So it's pretty nice to get a scene that's still dark, but has bright, vibrant colors as well. I'm going to do my stuff. What are you going to do? I'm going to do the best I can. Okay, that's a different Christmas movie right there. Jack gets ready to head out as the literal Two-Face Mayor, played by Glenn Shaddix, oversees the flight. Sally causes fog to block everyone's view, but as we saw before, Zero's nose can light up and lead the way. See, out of nowhere, Sally's psychic subplot, the dog figured it out. I sense there's something in the wind. That's not making things better. I feel like most people agree that Sally's song is the weakest of the musical numbers. Which is a shame because it's not really a bad song. It's just slow, sung a little awkward, and grinds the film to a halt. All the momentum of a few seconds ago is put on hold for Sally singing how we already know she feels. On the other hand though, this is the closest we have to a love song, and again, there is something cool that's about how the person she loves will seemingly never love her back. For I am not the one. If there's an opportunity to creatively depress children, I'm kind of all for it. The song doesn't last long though, and we're given some of the most entertaining stuff in the movie. Jack's terrifying Christmas presents. The only thing funnier than the gifts is Jack's blind optimism that everyone is loving them. You're welcome, one and all! If you survive, give me five stars on Yelp! Desperate to fix things, Sally tries to break in and free Santa. Uh, what have we here? Unexplained leg is the best kind of leg. What? You try to make a dupe out of me? Don't you know the foot is all I require? Oogie captures them both. Meanwhile, the army locates Jack and shoots him down. Like a true politician, the mayor says he knew the bad idea he said was a good idea was a bad idea. I knew this Christmas thing was a bad idea. I'm gonna go check out Kwanzaa land. Jack survives though and sings all about the misery he caused. Why does nothing ever turn out like it should? Like Wreck-It Ralph, I have to admire a movie where the message isn't follow your dreams, but rather... cope. Bored with your life? Well, you could be dead. Little blessings, you piece of shit. I am the Pumpkin King! <laughs> he announces he's back as the Pumpkin King, but realizes he has to save Santa in order to put things right. <laughs> what the... <laughs> Hello, Oogie. How the hell'd you do that? I mean, the doll, maybe, but the red guy's like a Raiders of the Lost Ark ball! This leads to, in all honesty, a pretty pointless climax. Well, come on, bold man! Again, if Oogie was built up as the villain earlier, maybe this could work, and even then, that's a big maybe. I feel like this is a movie that doesn't really need a villain. But he's a guy introduced in the third act. There's not much of a rivalry between him and Jack. And like Sally's song, everything kind of comes to a halt for it. This just doesn't feel like a story where the lead dodges a villain's death traps. That's more of a comic book feel, where this had more of a fairy tale vibe. But again, it is creative and leads to a pretty fun death scene. Don't look at my dung beetles. I'll admit Santa stomping out the last bug is pretty funny. But he has work to do as he restores Christmas back to normal and Jack returns home. Santa even brings a little bit of Christmas to Halloween. 
Again, as if that isn't being done. Careful, my precious jewel. Well, somebody got an idea watching season one of Loki. Jack and Sally finally confess their love for each other and thank God they kiss far away because I don't want to think of the mechanics of doll lips kissing skeleton teeth. And that was The Nightmare Before Christmas. I can't pretend it's absolutely flawless, but it's pretty close. It does take a certain mindset to enjoy it, certainly embracing simplicity more than complexity, but that doesn't mean it isn't astoundingly imaginative. I think it's particularly the visuals and concept that really makes it timeless, as anyone can watch this and follow what's going on even if there was no dialogue and be blown away by what they're looking at. The songs are also very refreshing, not just for how many there are, 11 in case you're wondering, at a time when most Disney films had half that, but they also move the story forward and help the characters express what they're feeling. It never feels like something that was written to also have a hit on the radio or anything. Even though you don't hear it on the radio though, people still hum these songs all the time and remember these characters. The main reason being, they're very simple, but likable. Though I can't say it's for everyone, it's proven over the years that it is for a lot of people. And I can happily say I am definitely one of those in that twisted mix. I'm a nostalgia critic, and nostalgia ween has just begun! Ow. How queer! Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out, and this week we are doing Edgewood Children's Ranch, uh, founded in 1966, though so it goes back quite a bit. Uh, this is a Christian oriented, non denominational residential agency serving children and families of Central Florida. Edgewood's mission is to rehabilitate youth at risk and their families, returning children to their homes and society as healthy, functioning young people, and getting them back to the appropriate academic level in school. This mission is accompanied, uh, is accomplished, excuse me, uh, through three major areas, cottage life, education, and counseling. Uh, through its residential co-educational program for boys and girls ages 6 to 17, the ranch today is able to accommodate more than 70 children at a time. And as usual, this is one that has four stars on Charity Navigator. It's a really, really good place trying to help so many children. As you can see, it's been around for a very, very long time. So please look into it. See if you can uh, donate. If not, spread the word just of the good that people are doing. And uh, hopefully you can just get that information around as much as possible because like I said there's so many people doing so much good stuff in the world so that's about it I'll see you next time take care